I am live on Facebook. And I'm trying to do live on Periscope. There we go. Hello, Periscope. Periscope always pops up right away. Facebook is sometimes it's kind of iffy. <laughs> All right, I'll give a few minutes for folks to come on. Um, I hope everybody's doing well tonight. Hope you've had a good day and a good week. And uh, this is second Thursday night. Last Thursday was the 1st of October, so this is the second Thursday. Remember that on second Thursday nights, we do teaching in our No More Genies series. Now, I'm going to explain what that is in a minute. Just want to give people a chance to come on. And I uh, also want to say welcome to the people on the podcast. And welcome to people that are listening to me from all over the world, wherever you are, and at whatever point in time you're listening to this. If you watch this live or if you download the podcast, this might be years from when it was first recorded. It's uh, Thursday, October 8th, 2020. That's the original recording date of this teaching, of this podcast, of these videos. But I definitely want to extend a warm welcome to anyone that's listening at any point in the future. <laughs> and I know that the word of God and the spirit of God do not change. And I know that his anointed word will be a blessing to any that hear it and believe it and receive it and incorporate its teachings into their lives. That's why I always, <clears throat> excuse me, feel so honored to be able to be used by God to bring his word because God showed does not need us, but in his graciousness, he allows us to be a part of his kingdom. He allows us to be a part of his program. He allows So, yeah, so I'm just really proud, happy, and excited to be a part of his kingdom because his kingdom is eternal and his kingdom never ends and his kingdom never fails. Okay. His kingdom never ends and his kingdom never fails. So I'm happy to be. I'm happy to know the Lord. I'm happy to be a part of his kingdom and uh, happy to be used by him. Okay, so it's seven o'clock, so I start on time. So we're going to say a word of prayer and jump right in. Thank you, O oh God, for today. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for this teaching, O oh God. Thank you for your precious Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for indwelling us and staying with us and being faithful. Oh God, and thank you, oh God, for your kindness. And thank you, oh God, for your mighty, unchanging word. And God, I just ask you, I surrender myself to you tonight, oh God. Use me. Lord, I surrender my mind, my heart, my lips, my teeth, my tongue, my hand gestures, everything, oh God. I surrender my whole self to you, oh God, so you can breathe through me, so you can speak through me, oh God, so that what you want communicated and released into the earth realm will be done so uh, by the leading of your and the prompting of your spirit that you might be glorified in all things and that your body might be edified and that hell might be horrified and that unbelievers would be challenged to turn from their ways, turn from their unbelief, turn from being the Lord over their own lives and surrender their lives to you, O oh God, so that you might grant them abundant life and eternal life to the saving of their souls. And I just thank you for it, Lord, because I know you, you want all humans to know your love and know your grace and know your spirit and know your word. So I just thank you for an opportunity to be a part of that program. So speak to me, O oh God, and glorify yourself in all things. It's in Jesus' name. 
We pray and give thanks and we expect great things. We expect you to move and signs and wonders and miracles shall follow this prophetic teaching. We expect you to manifest yourself and do mighty things. We declare and decree it and it is so. In Jesus name, we pray and believe and decree, <clears throat> amen. All right. Okay, now. Like Periscope went down. Okay, all right, hold on. I gotta fire Periscope back up. Yeah, I know that's the devil getting my internet connection, but he has no right. He cannot stop the word of God because the gates of hell shall not prevail against the kingdom of God, because the kingdom of God is built on the rock and that rock is Christ and the fact that Jesus is the son of God. Okay, all right, I'm just still waiting on Facebook, oh, excuse me, Periscope to pull up. Anyway, Facebook is up. Tonight's lesson, <clears throat> and remember where No More Genies is, those of you that are unfamiliar with the NMG hashtag with No More Genies. What that means is, is that we're moving away from our genie concept of God and we want to move into the proper and actual concept of God based on what the word says. So we want to move away from fairy tales and move away from religious systems and move away from our own imaginations and move away from our own limitations and move away from traditions and move away from cultural trainings, anything that's not actually the word of God. Anything that's not actually the Bible, we wanna move away from that. Anything that makes us feel like that God is magic, that faith is magic, that God just lives to grant our wishes and all we have to do is rub the lamp or say the magic word, uh, doesn't work that way. That's not who God is and his kingdom doesn't work that way. And that's not what faith is. Faith is not magic, okay? So we want to move away from any concept that's teaching us anything like that. And we want to, that's the genie concept of God. And we want to move into our actual biblical concept of God, where we see, I guess I should take my gloves off, where we see what God actually says in the word so we can believe that, live by that. Because uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we have to have the word preached to us we have, or prophesied to us or sung to us, we can hear it in song, we can hear it in preaching, we can hear it in prophesying, we can hear it in teaching, okay? But the word's gotta be preached, it's gotta be spoken, we have to hear it so we can receive it and believe it. That's the way God is set up to increase our faith. And so we have to rightly divide the word of truth, meaning we have to say what the Bible actually says, and then we have to ask the Holy Ghost to give us the understanding of what the Bible is saying and how it applies to our lives now so we can HBO, so we can hear it, believe it, and obey it, okay? And that's how we get rid of the genie concept because the genie concept of God is very dangerous. The genie concept of God has cost some people their lives. The genie concept of God has made people sacrifice their children and do foolish things because they didn't understand how the kingdom of God works. They didn't understand how faith works. They didn't understand who God is. Okay, and some people have left here early because of that. So that genie concept, that magic concept of God is very, very dangerous. Okay, so that's why we want to get a proper biblical concept of God. All right. Okay, our subject tonight. Hold on. Because for some reason, this is still, my periscope is still. Uh, well, I command you to work in Jesus' name. So let the internet be restored and work in you so I can get this broadcast out. So our subject tonight <clears throat> is forgiveness. Forgiveness. And I'm going to talk about what forgiveness is, and I'm gonna talk about what forgiveness is not. We're gonna look at what the scriptures say, and then we're gonna look at some practical applications 
for forgiveness and the understanding of it in our lives, okay? So first I want to start off with uh, what forgiveness is not. And you're going to hear me repeat this several times during the time tonight. Okay. Forgiveness is not denial. Like trying to act like something never happened. Forgiveness is not saying that what happened was okay. Agreeing with the sin or the wrong or the wrong done. Okay, forgiveness is not repression where you just shove it down and say, we're just not gonna deal with it. None of those things are forgiveness. Forgiveness is not ignoring things that happen. None of those things are forgiveness. That's what forgiveness is not. So sometimes we try to do those things. Sometimes we try to deny what happened. We just say, well, that wasn't true and that didn't happen and we didn't do that. Sometimes we try to repress what happened, we just shove it down in our souls and think it'll just go away, but it really won't. Sometimes we try to ignore. And sometimes, and here's the big one, you can see this a lot when we're dealing with families who have just lost uh, loved ones to gun violence. People are really, really quick to talk about forgiveness. They need to forgive. Or the families are really, really quick to talk about forgiveness and all that. But that doesn't really paint the whole picture. And so tonight, through the Holy Spirit, we're going to get a bigger picture of what forgiveness actually is, okay? Because forgiveness is not trying to say that what happened was okay. Forgiveness is also not a uh, rescinding of justice, that if justice needs to be done, that forgiveness wipes out the need for justice. Forgiveness is none of those things. But that's what a lot of many times that's what we think it is. And many times that's why people are struggling with forgiveness. Or many times when people say, you know, they won't forgive me, like if there's been an infraction in a personal relationship and somebody says they won't forgive me. And that may not really be true. It may not be forgiveness. That's the thing. It may not be forgiveness that's being struggled with. OK, because there's actually a process and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. But like I said, I want to start off with what forgiveness is not. OK, and it is not all those things that I named. It's not repression. It's not denial. It's not suppression. It's not agreeing with the wrong done. It's not a rescinding of justice. It's not ignoring what happened. None of those things are forgiveness. So with that being said, let's go to our scriptures. First scripture we're going to look at is 1 John 1 and 9. Okay, so let me type that in. 1 John 1 and 9. Okay. 1 John 1 and 9 reads like this. The Berean Study Bible Version. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, that word there, confess, okay, it means to assent. It's also talking about a covenant and an acknowledgement. So first off, when we're talking about confessing our sins before God, <clears throat> we have to agree with God that what we did was sin. We have to covenant with God that what we did was break one of his laws or violate one of his commandments or not do what he told us to do. So it's not just as simple as the words coming out of your mouth, but an agreement with God that what I did was wrong, what I did was sin, what I did was transgression, what I did was iniquity. OK, to be in covenant, to be in agreement with God that what happened was wrong. So it's not just saying the words. It's also, again, it being in covenant with God, agreeing with God that what happened was wrong, was incorrect, was sin, transgression, transgression or iniquity in the eyes of God. And then it says he is faithful and just to forgive us, forgive us. And that word there means, it's a combination word, 
in the Greek, but it means to send forth. In other words, to remove the sin, to wipe the debt from your account. That's very, very important that you understand that. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Let's look at the next scripture. The next scripture is Ephesians 1 and 7. Ephesians 1 and 7. Okay. Ephesians 1 and 7 reads like this. Okay. Ephesians 1 and 7 says, <clears throat> In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. New Living Translation, he is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. English Standard Version, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Okay, that word there, forgiveness, in Ephesians 1 and 7, it means ascending away, a letting go, a release, a pardon, complete forgiveness. Okay, it means freedom or pardon. So once again there, when we, God grants us forgiveness, he sends away our sins. He lets go of our sins. He uh, releases our sins. He pardons us. Okay, so that means he completely lets go of the debt. <clears throat> completely, he completely lets go of the debt. Okay. All right. Let's look at our next scripture. Our next scripture is Matthew 18 and 35. Matthew 18 and 35. Matthew 18, 35 says, uh, that is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Now, this is the end of the Lord telling the, par telling the parable of the unforgiving servant where there was a man that owed like $10 million to another man and went before the judge and the judge forgave him all that money. And then that same man that got forgiven of the 10 million, there was another brother who owed him like a dime. And he got so mad at that brother over that dime that he went him and grabbed him and choked him and said, you gonna pay me that dime. And the Lord was like, how you gonna hold that kind of debt against your brother when you just got forgiven of $10 million? So that's the parable that the Lord <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me, just got through telling. And he's saying, uh, the verse right before verse 34 says, in anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should repay all that he owed. That is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Okay, that word there, forgive, again, it means to send forth, to release the debt. And the Lord says, you have to do it from your heart. So in other words, you can't just go through the motions Remember, I told you before, you can't just say the words. You do need to confess it verbally. You do need to say the words, but you can't just be going through the motions when you do that. Okay. You've got to mean it from your heart. You've got to let it go from your heart. You've got to forgive your brother. You also have to forgive yourself, but you have to forgive, forgive so from your heart. And the Lord said, if you're still holding on to stuff, after all that God has forgiven you, then your sins are not going to be forgiven. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. And finally, the last scripture we're going to look at is John 20, 23. John 20 and 23 says, you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Okay. That's very important because the Lord is talking about how you can hold on to stuff. Right before this, a verse says he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So the Lord is telling his disciples that you have the power through the spirit to let stuff go. We have the power through the uh, If you ignore the power you already have through the spirit, you can withhold that forgiveness and hold on to the sins. So I'm going to expound on that a little bit later. So those are our scripture references, and I'm going to be referring to them as we go forward. But that's some of the scriptures in the Bible about forgiveness, about confessing 
and agreeing with God that what we did was wrong, but then also about how God lets it go. He pardons us, he wipes the slate clean. And the reason God does that is because Jesus died to pay for it. And it would be unjust of God to require payment uh, twice for the same thing. Jesus already suffered and died and was broken on Calvary's cross for the entirety of sin and the entire debt of sin. So that's why God cannot graciously offer us forgiveness once we confess and agree with him that we sinned against him because the Lord already paid the debt. So you don't have to pay twice. You see that? That's part of the beauty of the new covenant. Under the old covenant, they had to bring sacrifices to the high priest every year, bulls and goats, turtle doves and pigeons, because that blood did not forever wipe out the sin. That blood just appeased the wrath of God for a little while. But they, there was a remembrance, as the scripture says, of sins every year. But the blood of Jesus once shed, once Jesus died, once and for all, then that wiped out the debt once and for all forever. So the Lord never has to do that again. There doesn't need to be another sacrifice for sin. The Lord's broken body and shed blood covers the entirety of the debt of sin. That's part of the beauty of the new covenant. Okay, that's why it's so wonderful. Okay, so now that we've read those scriptures, so first we talked about what forgiveness was not. And then now that we've read the scriptures and we have some idea about what the Bible is talking about, we're talking about forgiveness. <clears throat> Let me go here. <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about now is the process. What I'm going to talk about now is the process, the process involved in forgiveness, because the process is really quite extensive. There's actually a lot of things that are going on in the process. And it's very important that we understand these steps because this is where we get confused. This is where communication breaks down. This is where we start to struggle because we don't understand every step or every point in the process. So now I'm going to talk about the process in detail. Okay. So here's step number one. Step number one is the infraction itself. And the infraction itself is the sin, the wrong, the, the, the mistake, or maybe it's on purpose, the transgression, the iniquity, okay? The, the thing that happens that is wrong, where someone has withheld something that they owe, or they've done something they shouldn't have done, or whatever form it takes, okay? But the infraction, the wrong, the sin has happened. That's the first thing, okay? But the second thing that happens is the consequences. Oh, Lord have mercy. Forgiveness does not wipe out consequences. And that's many times where people get confused. For example, like I was talking about earlier with the, the victims of gun violence. If you forgive someone for killing your loved one, your loved one is still dead. Because step number one is the infraction, the wrong that happened. But step number two was the consequences. If somebody slaps you on the face, somebody pops you upside your head and then asks for forgiveness, okay, your, your face still hurts. <laughs> your head still hurts. Your, your uh, skin still stings from the blow, from the hit. And that is one of the first points of confusion that people have about forgiveness. This is also when people say things like, you know, how many times can you sin and get away with it? And how many times will God forgive you and a whole bunch of stuff? When people say stuff like that, they don't have an understanding of what forgiveness is because forgiveness doesn't wipe out consequences. So let's say you have five kids by five different people and you lived a, a life of heavy fornication, heavy promiscuity. You slept around a lot. And you've got a whole bunch of different kids by a bunch of different people. And then one day you come under the word of God and then you come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the spirit of God cuts you to your heart and makes you realize that living that way is not appropriate for a believer. Living that way is not pleasing in the eyes of God. Living from person to person, person and bed to bed to bed is not what our Holy Father wants. That is sin in his eyes. So you hear the word of God preached, the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit cuts you to your heart and you realize what you've done is wrong. 
and you go before God and you say, God, I want to acknowledge and confess and admit that I have sinned. I've been a fornicator. I've slept with a whole bunch of different people and I've got kids by a whole bunch of different people and what I did was wrong. Okay. God will forgive you of your sin because you confess and agreed with him. You got in covenant with him. You agreed with him that what you did was wrong. But that forgiveness does not wipe out consequences. You still have them five children to raise. And that's where people get confused. Forgiveness does not, does not wipe out consequences. See, when you make a choice, any kind of choice, a thought, a word, is not just stuff you do with your hands. It's not just stuff you do out here. It's in here. If you make a choice to dwell on a thought, everything you eat, everything you say, whatever kind of choices you make, during the course of your day, they produce a consequence. That's one of the great laws of living. That's one of the great laws of life. That's why you can't get away from it. So if you make a wrong choice and you make a sinful choice and you confess and acknowledge to God that what you did was wrong, that forgiveness does not wipe out consequences. It doesn't wipe out consequences. If somebody is sitting, because this happened to me when I was a kid, I was sitting on a ledge at my house and somebody came and pushed me off <laughs> and I fell from that ledge and I hit the ground pretty hard too. I was maybe seven or eight when that happened. So if you push somebody off a ledge and they fall and they hit the ground hard and they hurt, if you ask them to forgive you, if they do or they don't, a consequence was still triggered by you pushing them off that ledge. They still fell and they still hit the ground hard. You see that? Cause that, again, that's one of the laws of life that every choice is gonna trigger a consequence. So that's where people get confused when they're talking about forgiveness. Because first of what happens is the infraction, the thing that, that's wrong. But the second thing that happens is the consequences. And sometimes the consequences aren't immediate. Some consequences are immediate. You feel them right away, but then some consequences are far reaching, like a life ended too soon or like I said, if you have, you know, like six or seven different kids by six or seven different people, if you ask God for forgiveness for the way you lived to make that happen, God will forgive you for those choices. But you still have your six or seven children to raise, and that's half a million dollars and anywhere from 16 years to a quarter century per child if you want to raise them kids properly. You see that? Because you still got consequences. So number one is the infraction. Number two, consequences are triggered, okay? Here comes step number three. Step number three is acknowledgement. And acknowledgement means that somebody has got to acknowledge what happened. So when we're going before God to ask for forgiveness, that's what we're doing is step number three. We're acknowledging it's like when King David wrote his famous psalm after he'd sinned with Bathsheba and he admitted his sin. But we're acknowledging before God that what we did was wrong. That step number three also has to happen between us as people, between us and our fellow man, meaning you have to acknowledge that what happened was wrong or what you did was wrong. See, and this is another place where we get hung up because I have to tell you. Sometimes that acknowledgement is never going to come. Ugh. I'm not talking about between you and God. I'm talking about between you and somebody that hurt you. Sometimes you're going to find yourself in situations because it might be with your parents and your parents might be dead or might be with an ex and that ex might be gone out your life and moved on a long time ago. There are going to be some situations in life where you are never going to get the acknowledgement that you wanted. And some people listen to me right now, wherever you are in life, hearing me right now, some people listening to me right now, huh, you've been sitting up in your life with your jaws tied for years now, maybe even decades, because you keep waiting for the person that did you wrong to apologize. They may never apologize, or they might be dead, or they might die before they can acknowledge what happened. And even if they could, maybe they never will. Don't you understand that some people never take responsibility for the wrong that they've done? 
Do you understand that some people never, never, ever see? So that's why I had to tell, I had to say that in your hearing so that you understand that you can acknowledge your sins before God, but you can't ever make another person acknowledge their sins. You can't make them acknowledge their sin against God. And you certainly can't make them acknowledge their sin against you. And that's where people get confused. That's where people get hurt. And that's how people get hurt and stay hurt for long periods of time. Because you keep saying, well, they owe me an apology. Maybe they do, or maybe they don't. Or maybe they don't think they do. Maybe they don't think they did anything wrong. The point I'm trying to make here is that apology may never come. So what you have to do for step four acknowledgement is you have to acknowledge it, acknowledge it. That's why you heard me say at the beginning of the hour that forgiveness is not denial. Forgiveness is not suppression or repression. And I know that sounds crazy, but sometimes you have to, you can use several different techniques. I talked about some of those techniques before, but a really good technique is writing stuff down, is journaling, where you write down what happened because that other person might not ever acknowledge it, but where you write down what happened. Another good technique is uh, talking to someone else, not the, the guilty party or the person involved, but someone not involved at all, someone that's a friend and acknowledging because it needs to be spoken, it needs to be said. You need to tell somebody. Now, you don't need to tell the world. Now, everything you go through doesn't need to be put on social media. Everything that happens doesn't need to be acknowledged in dramatic fashion, but it does need to be acknowledged. And so sometimes to facilitate the, the moving on of the process, many times that's when people need to understand that it must be acknowledged. If it's never acknowledged by the person that did it to you, then you acknowledge it by journaling and writing it down or telling a trusted confidant so you can talk about it and get it out but it has to be acknowledged, okay? And until it gets acknowledged, it can't be dealt with. So let's review our steps so far. Step number one is the infraction, the thing that happens that's wrong. Step, no, step number two is the consequences that are triggered. And those consequences are gonna happen, okay? The consequences that are triggered from the infraction. Uh, number three, the acknowledgement. Okay, the acknowledgement, the acknowledgement that the wrong was done. Okay, then we move to step number four. And step number four is the actual forgiveness. And forgiveness, as I told you, as we saw in the scripture, is the releasing of the debt owed, the wiping clean of the slate. Man, when God forgives us, he gives us a clean slate. He gives us a clean slate. And the reason he is both faithful and justified God is right to do that because, again, Jesus paid the price at Calvary's cross. And that's why the new covenant is so wonderful. And that's why his grace is so powerful. That's why the name of the song is not mediocre grace or some time and grace or time and wine and grace. The name of the song is amazing grace because that's amazing. Amazing that he would set up a system where he would die to pay for sins and wrongs that weren't even his own. And he would die to pay so that he could grant us forgiveness. Oh, oh, that's just, that's just incredible. That is just unspeakable in its beauty and its power. So step number four is the actual forgiveness, the releasing of the debt, okay? But remember, again, I told you what forgiveness is not. It's not suppression, it's not denial. It doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And it doesn't mean that consequences didn't happen as a result. It means that in spite of all, all that, I've chosen, like the Lord said, when he breathed the Holy Spirit on him, he said, you have the power to not retain somebody's sins. And what that means is that you don't have to walk around with your jaws tight for the rest of your life because of what somebody did to you. And whenever you talk about something, is it fair? Okay, well, you don't, there's no such thing as fairness, by the way, in this life, there's no such thing as fairness, but you don't have to walk around for the rest of your life in jail 
to what happened to you. You can release the debt. You can release that person. You can release what happened. That's forgiveness. That's actually step number four. But you can actually release the debt, wipe the slate clean, and you can let it go. That's what God does. That's why uh, 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 it's so wonderful. So wonderful. Okay. Because he wipes your slate clean. Okay. And so that's what you can choose to do by the power of his spirit when there have been infractions against you. Okay. That's step number four, but we're still not done. Got more steps. Okay. Here's a big one. Step number five. Step number five is healing. Good Lord Almighty. Healing. Healing. Now, this is a step, once again, to use the example of someone that's lost a loved one through, through gun violence. This is a step that, that I suspect people think you're supposed to rush through. Okay. But uh, healing takes a little bit of time, even if that process is sped up. If you get a cut or a gash, a deep gash, you know, your body starts healing itself as soon as the cut happens. But you, you have to stop the bleeding. So you might have to use a tourniquet. And then you might want to use a Band-Aid because your skin will repair itself. But it will create a scab. And everybody knows if you keep picking at your scabs, it ain't going to never heal. <laughs> okay? You got to give it some time to scab over. You got to protect them when the scab's over, okay? And then as the Bible says, the blueness of a wound cleanses it. Uh, so sometimes those wounds turn blue or purple as they're healing, and you can see that color change. And then over a period of time, the color on your skin, wherever that cut was, returns back to normal, okay? But that's how you know that healing has taken place. Another way that you know healing has taken place is when you can touch that area and there's no pain. There might be a scar because the scar is the kind of the memory of the mark that it happened, but there's no pain. That's how you know you're healed. Okay, well, your soul is the same way. <laughs> your soul is exactly the same way. And so many times, again, people try to rush this part. Okay, people got to heal. And that's different for different people. Some people heal faster than others. Some people just, you know, kind of look like they just moved through some stuff, but other people sometimes struggle with some stuff. But regardless of the, the speed involved and the time involved, you still have to heal. You still have to heal. You still have to heal. And that's uh, another one, a big area where people get hung up because they don't understand that even when forgiveness has occurred, even when the debt has been released and the slate been wiped clean, they don't understand that you still got to heal, that healing still has to take place. And sometimes people try to rush that process, okay? And you got to give it how, wh whatever amount of time it takes because it's different for different people and it's different for different types of infractions. Some things people can, you know, maybe talk some trash or give you a little, you know, give you a little cut or give you a little dig. And maybe you didn't think it was that funny. Sometimes you can just blow it off. Sometimes people can say something that was the absolute wrong thing to say. And that's going to trigger a different level of reaction. Okay. And then they need some time to heal from that. So step number five is healing. Okay. What's the next step that comes after healing? Oh my goodness. The next step is restitution. Restitution. This is a, a lot of what people don't talk about in Christianity, but this is actually a part of the law. Now, let me quickly give you just a little quick going over of the difference between civil law and criminal law in our American court system. So, so for those of you that are watching me outside of America, what I'm talking about is our legal system here. And I'm going to talk briefly about the difference between civil law and criminal law very, very briefly. Okay. All right. A basic definition of civil law is the body of law having to do with the private rights of individuals. Okay. Civil law is between people, not the government. The government is what brings criminal charges when you've broken a governmental law and the government 
is trying to charge you with something for breaking uh, a state or a federal law, that's a criminal case. Those are criminal charges. That's when you've done something on that level. But when there's something wrong between you and another party, then that's a civil case, that's civil law, and they can sue you. And that's called civil, a civil litigation or civil lawsuit. And if it involves an injury, that injury action is called a tort. That's tort law. Okay. So the, the purpose, the goal of civil litigation is to compensate the plaintiff. In other words, it's trying to make you whole. So in other words, whatever that person did to you, whatever they took from you, or if they hurt you, however they robbed you or shortchanged you or offended you, the goal of a civil lawsuit is to try to restore that is your restitution to try to either restore you to the state that you were before the infraction happened or compensate you with damages because it happened. For example, if you kill someone, now if you have enough faith to raise them from the dead, you can bring them back from the dead. Okay, that happens in the scriptures all the time uh, where people came back from the dead. The Lord was the only person to do that. Elijah did that, Elisha did that. So, but if you don't have enough faith to raise somebody from the dead, then they are gonna stay dead. OK, so in other words, if someone murders someone, then uh, uh, when you sue them, you're not actually suing them to get that dead person back. That would be nice. But you're suing them for damages for the hurt and the pain and suffering that they caused you by murdering your loved one. But the point of civil law, again, is to make you whole. It's restitution. That's not criminal law. That's not criminal charges where you've broken a local, state, or federal law against some type of uh, authorized official government, and then they're bringing criminal charges against some th some violation against them. Okay, so on the civil law tip, the idea there is to make you whole, and so the step right after healing is restitution, and restitution really speeds up healing. So, in, put in practical terms, if somebody borrows a hundred dollars from you and then they ghost they stop calling you you know we don't we're not really meeting in person that much these days but they stop calling you they stop talking to you they stop answering your texts you know you can't facebook message them they just ghost on you to really uh make things right they need to give you that hundred dollars back plus the interest for however long they borrowed it however long it took them to pay them back if they said they pay you back and they didn't and they just disappeared they need to give you that money back with some interest that actually will restore you that excuse me that actually will give you restitution or make you whole because you have your hundred dollars back plus you have the interest that you would have gotten if you put that hundred dollars like in a savings account uh, because you basically invested in them a hundred dollars you could have put somewhere else would have produced like a hundred dollars in a penny or a hundred and one dollars or a hundred five dollars something like that so they give you a hundred five dollars back that's restitution for the money they borrowed, but they didn't pay back on time. Okay. That's a step many times that's skipped <laughs> among believers and unbelievers alike. That that if it's if it's possible to have restitution, we should at least try to do it. And that again, that's what civil lawsuits are about. Trying to make you whole, because remember that forgiveness uh, does not wipe out consequences. Something happened because of what you did. So is there a way you can't undo what you did and you can't undo the consequences, but is there a way to make me whole, make me bring me back to the state I was before you sinned against me? And finally, the final step is restoration. Restoration means a rejoining a fellowship, a restoring of our fellowship, meaning, you know, we're good again. We're cool. We're smooth. We're friends again. We all right. OK, now, the reason that God can go through all that process with us is because he has already legally laid all of our sins on Jesus. So the wrath of God was emptied out on Christ at the cross. So the healing has already been paid for and released and the restitution. We don't have to pay God back. We can't pay God back. How could we ever pay God back for the blood of Jesus? Do you think there's something we could do to to make that right? No. See, so 
so the restitution was given to Jesus by Father when he raised him from the dead and sat him at his right hand and gave him the rod of iron whereby he rules the nations and the diadem, the crown of crowns, making him the king of kings and the Lord of lords and giving him the name that was above every name and re-glorifying him as God again and giving him an eternal kingdom to where there is no end and saying that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow and Jesus could sit down and rest from his work until his enemies be made his footstool. That's Jesus' rest restitution for dying on the cross. And Father gave him that. We could not give the Lord that. So Father gave Jesus the restitution because all of the sins that Jesus died for were not his own. You see that? So what the Lord was owed for a substitutionary death was paid for by Father with all the things that Father gave Jesus. So that's why we don't have to do it because we couldn't do it if we had to. I'm so glad that they came up with a plan and a system that legally satisfied every corner and every angle of the equation. Because if, can you imagine if Father God required of us to pay Jesus back? If Jesus required of us, how could you ever pay the Lord back for that sacrifice? How would such a thing even be possible? Where would you start? Okay, so let's go over those steps again. The infraction happened, that's the sin. It triggers consequences, step number two. Step number three is there must be acknowledgement. Somebody got to acknowledge that this happened. Step number four is the actual forgiveness, the releasing of the debt. Step number five is healing, where after the, the cut has happened, the cut has to heal. Step number six is restitution, meaning is there some way I can make you whole to the way you were before this happened. That's what happens in civil law. And then God is gracious and abundant and God does exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think. So Jesus was uh, arrested and beaten on Tuesday and put in jail. And then they woke him up early Wednesday morning and beat him some more and they hung him on a cross nine o'clock Wednesday morning. And he stayed on the cross until three o'clock Wednesday afternoon. So for that, when, it, when they came to the garden of Gethsemane to arrest Jesus, for that time and then all the beating and all the bleeding and all the whippings and all the embarrassment and shame and spit and the disrobing and the nailing to the cross and then the going down to hell to preach to those that had lived before Christ so Jesus could let them know that he was the Christ. For all of that, Father God gave restitution to Jesus for all that he did. And then finally, there's restoration. Restoration means we're good again. So that's why God goes through that process. It's already bought and paid for, which is why we confess our sins. We're good again with God because he already took care of everything else. But when it comes to us, our horizontal relationships, our person to person, like I just have to stop and praise him for a minute. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your plan of salvation. But when it comes to our, our relationships, our horizontal relationships, our relationships to each, to each other, this is where we struggle because many times people don't even know all of these steps. So when you hear, let me give you another example. Let's say there's been cheating. Let's say there's been infidelity. Let's say there's been adultery. And whoever did the cheating got caught by the other person, or maybe they confess to the other person. Sometimes we say things like, they won't forgive me. My husband won't forgive me. My wife won't forgive me. And it may not be that they didn't forgive you or that they won't forgive you. It's just that you're ignoring the other steps in the process because there's been infidelity. That's the infraction. That's the sin. That's going to trigger some consequences. Like, for example, there's going to be a break of trust because you kill the trust, man. You just kill the trust. Whatever relationship you had is gone now. Uh, lying does that as well. When you get busted in a lie, it kills trust. The funny thing about being busted in a lie is it has a retroactive effect, meaning it makes the other person wonder if you ever told the truth about anything. I mean, it's just really something. If, if you guys were good and you had a strong trust relationship or you thought you did and then just blatantly lie and then you get caught in that lie, that other person is going to wonder, what else have you lied about? When else did you lie? What other times did you lie to me? Has the whole thing been a lie? It's really something. See, that's a consequence. And it gets triggered when we lie or when we cheat. You see that? 
fraction consequences and then an acknowledgement. What that other person wants you to do is admit what you did because that's what you would want if and when the shoe is on the other foot, which is why we should not get self-righteous and indignant. It's, it's a challenge to keep a hum humble spirit when you're angry and you're hurt. I will admit that when you're angry and hurt, ain't nothing wrong with being angry and hurt. And the acknowledgement on your part is you have to acknowledge I'm angry and I'm hurt because you did this. But what you want them to do is you want them to acknowledge what they did and that what they did was wrong. That's what we have to do to get our forgiveness of God from God. So it's not this big leap. If you don't confess your sins before the Lord, your sins just pile up before him and his throne. And remember, I told you, that's why America is under judgment now, because we have all this unconfessed sin. And unconfessed sin is to the nostrils of God like uh, trash in your kitchen. Because after a while, that trash piles up. And after a while, that trash starts to stink. And it stinks really badly. And you get to the point where you can't take it anymore, so you have to throw it out. Well, when there's unconfessed sin before the throne of God, it gets in his nostrils and it gets to the point where he can't stand it. And his judgment is going to fall. He's going to get that. He's going to deal with that. See that? So there must be acknowledged. You got to acknowledge. That's why your friend or your romantic partner or whoever, that's why they're mad because you never acknowledged what you did and that what you did was wrong. But don't get self-righteous and indignant and full of yourself because the day is going to come where the shoe going to be on the other foot. We all end up on both sides of that coin over the course of our lives. Sometimes we are the one that has done wrong. And sometimes we are the one that has been wronged. But either way, there has to be an acknowledgement. And that's why if it never comes, that's why some people get hung up on that step never understanding that you can acknowledge it if they don't, okay? Number four is the actual forgiveness, the releasing of the debt. But then there's the healing. Once again, if you lied and it was just the ugly lie or a little white lie or a big black lie or whatever kind of lie, you know, they may not be able to just bounce back from all that and just restore trust like the lie didn't happen. They're gonna have to heal from that. And when it's something like when you're dealing with, you know, something like, you know, a really deep relationship, like a, a marriage relationship or a long time friendship or something, then you're going to have to give them time to heal. Or if you were the one that was sinned against, you're going to have to take whatever time you need to heal. Now, the danger there is uh, taking, uh, I won't say taking too much time, but I will say never actively moving towards healing. Because remember, that forgiving them does not mean that what they did was right. Forgiving them does not mean that what they did was okay. And forgiving them does not mean that you agree with what they did. That's not, remember, that's not what forgiveness is. But healing means I don't want to walk around with this cut on my arm for the rest of my life. I don't want to walk around with this wound in my soul or this, this, this hurt in my heart for the rest of my life. And so actively moving towards healing, you know, it's going to take some amount of time and you need to take whatever time you need, but you need to be trying to heal, okay? Because if you're not, then what's gonna happen is what they did to you is gonna take root and then you're gonna turn bitter. And the Bible says that we should not fail of the grace of God, lest any root or bitterness, I need to give you that scripture. Okay, we need to uh, include that in our scriptures for the night because it's very po uh, powerful and very necessary. That is Hebrews 12, 15, Berean Study Bible. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up to cause trouble and defile many. Uh, I like the King James, looking diligent, diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. Hebrews 12 and 15. Let me put that in the chat. Now, the reason that's so important is because of what I just told you, and that is that if you are not actively moving towards forgiveness, uh, excuse me, actively moving, moving towards healing in the healing process, then that thing is going to settle. And uh, uh, there's something uh, you need to listen to 
a lady by the name of Apostle uh, Dr. Purnell Hewing, Dr. Purnell Hewing, you can look her up online. She has this powerful ministry uh, called The Sanctuary in Whitewater, Wisconsin. She talks about something called taproot bondages. I cannot do that teaching justice because it's not my revelation, it's her teaching. You have to hear her teaching. But long story short, she, she talks about how wounded areas of the heart and the soul, how the root of bitterness begins to entangle and entwine in those areas and grip them. And then what happens is that root of bitterness, your heart starts getting used to being bitter and your soul starts to form around the bitterness. And then what happens is you start thinking that that's actually you. You start thinking that when you start having an attitude and all those things, you start thinking that that's really who you are. And no, it's just that you're hurt and you never got the healing that you needed. But again, I can't do her teaching justice. You need to look her up, but it's called a taproot bondage. It's, it's a, a wound, a hurt that has gotten so deep inside of you that it has nestled and taken a hold in your heart or your soul. Okay. All right. So that's healing. And then there's restitution. We talked about that, about trying to make you whole, trying to either restore you to the state you were in before the infraction happened. But many, many times that can't happen. If there's been infidelity, you can't go back to where you were before you cheated. That's not something you can take back. If there's been a lie, especially a long time lie, you can't go back in time and, you know, make it be like it was before the lie came out. If someone's been murdered, unless you got enough faith to raise them from the dead, if you don't have enough faith to raise them from the dead, because you can raise them from the dead through faith. But if you don't have enough faith to raise them from the dead and they stay dead, well, then they're not going to come back. OK, so restitution in those cases is especially again, I talked about civil versus criminal law where there's some type of compensatory damages to try to give you money to try to help you move forward with your life because they actually cannot restore the thing that was lost. And then there's restoration in terms of the rejoining of fellowship. That's always the point. That's the one that people want to get to. That's the one they want to hurry up and get to. Say, they won't forgive me. No, what you mean is they want you to treat you like all that never happened. God can do that because Jesus already paid for it. But us with people, we got to go through this whole process. You see that? So that's what I wanted to release tonight. That's what the Holy Ghost told me to release. It was about understanding forgiveness and the process of forgiveness and to look at the scriptures and to look at each one of the steps. So let me review those steps quickly again. I'm just going to list them. Number one is the infraction. Number two is the consequences of the infraction. Number three is acknowledgement of the infraction. Number four is forgiveness of the infraction. Number five is healing from the infraction. Number six is restitution. And number seven is restoration. Okay. That's the seven step process around forgiveness. Okay. So if you came on late or at whatever point you jumped on, uh, listen to this, go back to the top, listen to it from the beginning and be sure that you can walk yourself or ask the Lord to help you walk through each one of those steps. It will bring great healing in your life once you understand each one of the steps in the process. It'll bring great understanding. It'll open your eyes. In many, many cases, it'll get you out of jail. Okay, you might still be in jail. You might be mad at your mother and your father. And they may be gone or dead. You need to get out of that jail and you need to heal because they're not around to acknowledge. So you need to walk yourself through the process, get yourself through the steps so you can get back to a restoration of fellowship with your own soul so that you can enjoy being you without all them scars and with all, without all that pain. Let me tell you, that's the life you want to live. You want to live the life where you are free to be yourself. For example, if you are a trusting person and you got hurt because somebody lied to you or abused you, if you hold on to that abuse, then you're going to end up being, excuse me, somewhat bitter or somewhat cynical. You won't be as trusting before. And then that's you not being you. See, it isn't that you need to stop being trusting. It, it is that you need to pick a better caliber of person to trust. Good God Almighty. When somebody was listening to me, let me say it one more time. If you're a very trusting person and you got hurt and someone told you that you're naive, you were simple, you were a chump, 
you were a victim. Don't receive any of that. Don't receive any of those words. If you have a loving, trusting heart, there's nothing wrong with having a loving and trusting heart. But what you have to do is you have to be careful who you give that heart to. Because you are never going to be happy not being you. You understand that? However it is that God made you, if you've got a big heart and you've got a lot of love, then the way to enjoy your own heart and your own soul is to share that love. Because that's you. But if you've been hurt or you've been hurt really badly, you've been being disappointed, and now you have bottled that up. See, now you're not being you. So you need to walk yourself through the process so that you can restore the fellowship with your own soul because you have a loving soul. Did you know that your soul was a gift from God? Did you know that you are fearfully and wonderfully made? God made you the way he made you on purpose. And he wants you to enjoy your own soul. He wants you to enjoy your own life. He wants you to enjoy the life that he gave you. And you can't enjoy your life if you're not being yourself. One more time. <laughs> you can't enjoy your life if you're not being yourself. It will not happen. It can't happen. So that's why you need to go through the seven steps, go through the process. So if nothing else, you may not ever make it right with that other person. It may not be possible to make it right with that other person. And they may choose not to forgive you. They may hold a member. I read the scripture. They may retain that sin against you for the rest of their lives. You can't control that because you can't control anybody but you. But that's the, the flip of that is that that's the beauty of these seven steps that you can control you and that you can come back and be you again. Let's say you've had moral failure. Let's say you've you've lived a life that's below the moral or the ethical standard that you set for yourself. You set a bar at a certain level and then you made some choices that were well below that bar and you disappointed yourself. You you were angry at yourself. You you're you're hurt at yourself because you set a bar at a certain level and you did some things that didn't measure up. Well, you need forgiveness. You need self-forgiveness. You know why? Because if you release yourself from that debt, you can get up and try again. Is it possible to try again? Yes, it is, because the scripture says, this is why God has to be first in your life. The scripture says that the just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. The just man falls seven times. See, that means it's possible for righteous people to sin, to fall, and sometimes we do. So if you set a bar, and you, live, you didn't live up to that bar and you disappointed yourself, guess what? You can work through the process and get forgiveness and get a, a restoration of fellowship with your own soul and love being you again. Because if you're a person of high morals, you're not going to be happy unless you're living by those high morals. If you're a person of high ethics, you're not going to be happy with your life unless and until you're living by those high ethics. Now, remember that everybody sets their moral and ethical bars at different places. It's not for you to say where other people set their bar, but you have the freedom to set your bar wherever you want. And if you have disappointed yourself, I stop by with a message from the Holy Spirit of God, according to the scriptures, that God will forgive you and you need to forgive you. And God has already worked through his process. That's what the blood of Jesus is for. And now you need to work through your process so that you can accept yourself so that you can say, you know what, I'm really a person of a high bar and I've done some things or said some things have been some places that were way far beneath how I want to live. God got some good news for you because God is a good God and he's a good God all the time. The good news is that you can work through the forgiveness process, that process I just outlined for you, and you can forgive yourself and you can heal and you can say, now I know that I need to live by the moral and ethical standards I set for myself because that's what makes me happy. And when you're doing that, you're being you again. <laughs> that's why forgiveness and healing, and that, that's, why, that's why it's so necessary. I'm excited. I'm excited. I praise God. Can I list the seven steps in the comments? All right, son, I will do that. My son asked me to list the seven steps in the comments, and I will do exactly that. So hold on, let me copy those over. I will do 
that very thing. I'm going to list the seven steps in the comments, uh, but I also want you to go back to the top of the video and listen from the top so you can hear me acknowledge and kind of break down the uh, uh, explanation and the understanding for each one of these steps. But I will definitely list them in the comments. Coming up, right, I'm just getting that together. Okay. And here we go. All right, and there we go. <clears throat> okay, so there are the seven steps in the comments, the infraction. The, the hurt, the wrong, the sin, the transgression, the consequences thereof, acknowledgement of what happened, forgiveness, the actual releasing of the debt. Number five, the healing from the consequences of what happened, the restitution, the trying to restore, the make to make you whole, to bring you back to the way you were, or to compensate you for what was taken away. And then the restoration means the restoration of fellowship, meaning that we're good again. You are welcome. Okay. And so that's how we bring God's forgiveness. And that's how we bring forgiveness and healing to our own souls. Remember that the great commandment of God is to love your neighbor as yourself, not love your neighbor instead of yourself. That's another churchy thing. See, a lot of people don't understand what the purpose of God has been through all this COVID and all this global pandemic and all this lockdown. One of the things that God has been trying to do all year long is to tear down all the religious systems, all the systems that were not giving us the good actual word of God, that were not giving us the word of God that we need to live by and giving us a bunch of churchy phrases, a bunch of religious systems, a bunch of things that didn't have any power and a bunch of things that were not from God, did not, that did not give us life. Because in his word, there is life, okay? But in the religion and the religious systems and the traditions of men, and you know, mama said, and you know, dad said, and we've always done it this way, that kind of thing, ain't no power in that. There's no life-giving power in that. The only power is in the rightly divided word of God. And that word of God's gotta be activated through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's where the power is. That's how you build your faith. That's what releases the anointing and destroys the yoke of the enemy and tears down anything that's not like Christ. It's that mighty anointed word that does that. The Bible is that written word. Jesus is that living word. The Bible made alive, the Bible in action. And then there's that prophetic or the rhema word, the fresh breeze right now word from God that normally comes through the prophetic. That's where the power is. So God has spent all of 2020 or at least most of 2020, at least since March when a lockdown hit, isolating us. You know, we can't gather in church like we used to. Some people are still fighting to do so, but telling us that all that stuff that was dead and all that stuff that wasn't from him and all that stuff that was not according to his word has to go. It has to be torn down. Do you understand? That's been part of the point of 2020. And I know some people have missed that. So that's why I wanted to speak it and release it to you. To don't miss the point of all this suffering all this, what we've been going through so that we can actually have time to actually get in the scripture, get in the word, spend time with God, spend time with the Holy Spirit, talk to the Lord, develop our relationship and realize that God told you to love your neighbor as yourself, not love your neighbor instead of yourself. That means that part of the commandment of God is that you love you. What makes you think that God loves your neighbor more than he loves you? He doesn't. There is no respect of persons with God. That's in the Bible over 20 times, if you didn't know that. There is no respect of persons with God. There is no respect of persons with God. Whoever you are, whatever your demographics, whatever your age, your gender, your socioeconomic status, your level of education, uh, your skin color, your ethnicity, your primary language, 
uh, your diet, whatever part of the world you were born in, that that don't have nothing to do with God's dealings with you. There's no respect of persons with God. I told you, there's only one line that God, God draws between people, believers and unbelievers, people that believe God and people that don't. That's the only line. That's the line between life and death. That's the line between heaven and hell. That's the line between living and dying. I kid you not. That's not even an exaggeration. Either you believe God or you don't. It's just as simple as that. That's the only line God draws. Not the curl pattern over here for people that have hair. Not the color of your eyes. Not the shape of your nose. Not in all that. That's people. That's not God. Okay. And so what? So that's a long way to go for me to say that you're supposed to be loving you. Uh, there's such a focus in religious circles for people always trying to get you to forgive somebody else. Yeah, well, maybe you need to forgive you. Maybe you need to spend some time with you. Why do you think we had all this, this solo time? Maybe you need to get back to who you were before all that pain. And maybe you need to let the Holy Spirit shine a light on some areas in your heart and your soul that you're still hurting so that you can release and heal and so that you can be you again with a smile on your face that's genuine from your heart so you can enjoy the soul that God gave you. For example, and I'm going to say this a little bit and I'm going to be through. If you're the kind of person that loves to praise him, just loves to praise him, whatever that means for you. Some people praise him in the dance. Some people just like to shout his name. Some people raise their hands. Some people cry. But whatever, you can stand up, turn in a circle, but whatever it is that you do, you're showing your love for God, okay? And there's nothing wrong with that. We do that for our favorite sports teams. We do that for our pets. What's wrong? We're showing your love for God, nothing. But you may have, at some point in your life, gotten around a bunch of mean old religious people talking about, we don't do that up in here that kind of thing, and they try to make you feel bad for the way that you love the Lord. You may have been around it. If you're over the age of 13 and you've been in church longer than two years, I can almost guarantee that you've been around some religious people that when you got up to do your dance and you got up to give your shout, hey, thank you, and you got up to be loud for the Lord, they gave you that look, like, like mm. that kind of thing, and tried to shut you down and try to make you feel like that your expression of love for God wasn't appropriate. I stopped by to tell you that if you love him and you love to praise him, it's okay to be you. I, I want to release you in the name of Jesus to be you. Do your dance, give your shout, clap your hands, speak in tongues, turn in a circle, do your dance, bow down, prostrate on the floor. Cry your tears before the Lord because he said you can love me with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And don't let them mean religious people talk you out of being yourself. That's why you need healing. That if you love to praise him, don't change your praise. Change your surroundings. Don't change your praise. Change your crowd. <laughs> don't stop being who you are. Listen to the mean old religious people who don't like to praise him. Get yourself around some people that do like to praise him. And until we can gather together again, praise him yourself at home. See what I mean? That's an example of what I mean about how it's okay to be you, but you need to be okay with being you. And you no longer have to walk around with all that pain in your soul because of what somebody did to you. You can go through the seven step process and be free. And the scripture says that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there's freedom. That means God wants you to be free. The devil and people full of the devil are the people that want you in bondage. That's why you don't have to listen to them. But when you listen to the word, the spirit of God wants you to be free. The Holy Ghost says where I am, there's freedom. So I'm gonna walk in that freedom, amen. All right, that's it. For this No More Genies lesson. Uh, if you uh, have been blessed by this video, please like it and share it as many places as you can because whenever a prophetic word or teaching, what I did tonight was.
called prophetic teaching. Whenever a prophetic teaching goes forth from the Lord, we want as many people as possible to be exposed to it so they can hear the good word of God so they can receive the blessing. But I certainly receive the blessing. I'm certainly going to walk in it because God's talking to me just like he's talking to whoever hears it. See what I mean? And so please like and share it. Um, uh, if you want to bless me financially, my cash app is uh, dollar sign DMT2. Uh, I'll put that in the comments, but I'll also put that at the top of this video. If you want to sow into my ministry, because remember, whatever ministry you sow into, you get the blessings of that ministry. So your prophetic will increase, your prophetic anointing, your visions, all that will increase. And then um, uh, I want to encourage you to watch the other videos. So go on my YouTube channel and look up. It's uh, Prophet David Taylor. You can hashtag PDT and find it on YouTube. And look up uh, the No More Genie series. So you can look at the other No More Genie series because that whole series is about breaking down the wrong concepts and old foolish religious concepts that many of us grew up with and actually grabbing on to what the word actually says so we can walk in that freedom that the Holy Ghost wants us to have. Okay? All right. I'm going to go in the spirit and ask the Holy Ghost if there's anything else he wants me to release and then we'll be done. All right. Uh, those of you on the podcast, when you hear that silent break, I'm praying in tongues. I'm praying in the spirit. That's how you uh, get in touch. You serve your spirit. You charge your spirit and the spirit of God can take over when you pray in your prayer language. That's what that is. OK, so I don't get anything. So that means we're good for tonight. Amen. And amen. Thanks. God bless you to those of you that uh, watch me live. God bless you to those of you that are looking at the replay, replay and listen to the podcast. Remember, these principles, these scriptures are for you. OK. Uh, if nobody else gets it, you can get it and apply these principles to your own soul. You can you can receive forgiveness and healing and you can be free. All right. Amen. And God bless. I will see you Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the next weekly live prophetic word. God bless.